Hi, my name's Holly Ellis and I'm a clinical scientist in genomics at the Northwest Genomic Laboratory Hub based in Liverpool. I'm going to be delivering this presentation alongside my colleague Hannah Stevens, who is a trainee clinical scientist at the same lab. This presentation is entitled GPYD Testing Pharmacogenomics in a Clinical Setting. Throughout this presentation, we will provide some background information on the use of fluoropyrimidine chemotherapies and how DPD deficiency can lead to toxicity to this type of treatment. We will highlight the need for pharmacogenomic testing prior to treatment and discuss how we've implemented this service into clinical practice. We will share some of our results so far and hopefully we will highlight the importance of pharmacogenomic testing in a clinical setting. So just for some background information, in America, nearly 500,000 cancer patients each year are treated with chemotherapy containing fluoropyrimidines such as capecitabine and fluorouracil, otherwise known as 5-FU. This is the gold standard treatment for a variety of cancers including colorectal, breast, head and neck, pancreatic and gastric. Fluorouracils work as anti-metabolites which pre prevent cell proliferation. They primarily inhibit the enzyme thymidylate synthase, blocking the thymidine formation required for DNA synthesis. DNA therefore cannot be repaired and replicated so cells can no longer proliferate. After administration, a small proportion, around 5% of the 5-FU, is converted intracellularly to the active cytotoxic enzymes. But the majority of the administered dose is converted into an inactive metabolite by the DPD enzyme. It's estimated that between 12 and 30% of patients who are given this treatment suffer from severe toxicity. This can cause diarrhea, vomiting, cardiac problems, neurological problems, and in some cases, fatality. One of the main reasons as to why many patients were suffering with toxicity was due to DPD deficiency. As mentioned in the previous slide, the DPD enzyme is required to convert 5-FU into an inactive metabolite that can be safely expelled from the body. Patients with DPD deficiency have reduced inactivation of 5-FU, thereby increasing their exposure to active metabolites, and these individuals therefore have an increased risk of severe or fatal toxicity. The DPD enzyme is encoded by the DPYD gene and several variants within this gene are now known to cause toxicity to 5-FU. It is important here to note the difference between the name of the protein, DPD, and the name of the gene, DPYD. Some real-life patient stories were brought to the attention of the media who revealed examples of those who had suffered toxicity or fatality after treatment with 5-FU. Additionally, the families of some patients who suffered these effects decided to take legal action against the trusts that had administered the chemo, claiming that they were not warned about the potentially life-threatening consequences. All of this therefore led to an increase in public pressure for testing prior to treatment in order to identify those patients at increased risk of toxicity. It's really important to note that the DPYD gene is highly polymorphic with many known variants. The majority of variants within this gene are not known to affect protein function. However, four specific variants have been identified that are known to affect protein function and lead to an increased risk of toxicity to 5-FU. I've listed these on the slide. The bottom three variants are usually seen together in cis, and this is known as the HAP-B3 haplotype. According to the CPIC guidelines, the intronic variant is the likely causative variant underlying this haplotype. 
in accordance with the CPIC guidelines, a normal DPYD allele with no variant carries a DPD activity value of 1, giving patients with two normal alleles a total DPD activity value of 2. Each variant listed above carries a DPD activity of 0 or 0 0.5. Therefore, the DPD activity value may vary depending on what variant is identified and whether the patient is homozygous, heterozygous, or compound heterozygous for two different variants. The total DPD activity value is then categorised into a normal, intermediate, or poor metabolizer. Current guidelines for intermediate metabolizers state that the start and dose of fluoropyrimidine-based chemotherapy should be reduced to 50% of the standard dose. Dose is then titrated based on toxicity. So if there's no toxicity in the first two cycles, the dose should be increased to maintain efficacy. And if the start and dose is not tolerated, the dose should then be reduced in order to minimise toxicity. By upfront screening of these four variants prior to treatment, we can identify patients who are homozygous or heterozygous and therefore at an increased risk of toxicity to 5-FU. For these patients, the start and dose may be reduced and titrated based on toxicity as described in the previous slide, or an alternative treatment may be used. This will therefore improve patient care by preventing adverse effects and hospitalisation, which will subsequently lead to an overall cost saving. This service has now been commissioned by NHS England, and they released a statement regarding DPYD testing earlier this year. The positive impact of this service has been recognised by the media, and this article was published by The Guardian in December last year. It's evident that this will have a positive impact on the care and treatment of many patients receiving this type of chemotherapy. Before implementing this test into routine service, it was really important to engage with clinicians and service providers to ensure they understood the importance of the test and at which stage in the patient's journey that this test should be performed, i.e. prior to treatment. It was also important to ensure that clinicians were aware of the expected lab turnaround times and also the limitations of the test. The test that we've implemented in our lab is a Your Gene Health genomic testing kit to identify the four DPYD variants listed on the previous slides. Your Gene Health was previously known as a Lucid Gene Diagnostics. This kit allows for easy and quick data interpretation, and the workflow uses allele-specific amplification refractory mutation system, or ARMS, PCR, followed by capillary electrophoresis. It's important to note that this test cannot completely exclude toxicity to 5-FU, as we're only testing for these four variants. If we identify a variant, then we can conclude that a patient is at increased risk of toxicity, but if we do not identify a variant, we cannot completely exclude toxicity as there could be other contributing factors that we're not testing for. So ARMS PCR works using a two tube assay. Tube A mostly contains primers specific for the DPYD variants that we're testing for, and tube B contains primers specific for the wild type or normal allele. The primers are fluorescently labelled so that variant peaks appear in blue and wild type peaks appear in green. A patient who is heterozygous for one of the variants would therefore have a blue peak corresponding to the variant and a green peak corresponding to the wild type allele. Short tandem repeats or STR markers are also used in the kit to confirm sample identity and ensure the same patient's DNA is in tube A and tube B. 
The verification of the Your Gene GPYD assay was relatively quick and easy and was carried out in line with international standards. We measured specificity by running multiple sam samples with no known variants and we measured sensitivity by running multiple samples with known variants. The assay correctly identified the known controls and therefore reached 100% specificity and sensitivity. We also investigated measurement precision, reproducibility and robustness to ensure results were consistent with different equipment and different operators. The lab workflow was organised to ensure results were reported within five days of the sample arriving in the lab. This is one of the most urgent tests we perform in the lab as these patients are awaiting treatment. Upon arrival into the lab, samples are booked into the computer system and given a unique lab number. The details are reviewed by a genetic technologist to ensure the details have been entered correctly. And the following day, samples undergo DNA extraction and are then reviewed by a scientist. PCR is then set up and left to run overnight. The next day, samples undergo capillary electrophoresis and the electropherograms are used for data analysis and reporting. This seems like a quick and easy workflow. However, issues can arise if we receive unexpectedly high sample numbers as there's a limit to the number of samples that can undergo DNA extraction in any one day. Additionally, sometimes samples do not meet the minimum quality acceptance criteria, so need to be repeated. And finally, the lab does not normally operate during weekends or bank holidays, which can lead to delays in the process. And this has led to ongoing discussions surrounding a move towards seven day working in order to meet the demands of this service. I'm now gonna hand over to my colleague, Hannah, who will take you through some of the results that we've seen so far. Thanks, Holly. I'm going to start with an example of a normal result. Approximately 92% of samples received into the lab are normal. Now, as Holly said in a previous slide, DPYD Primer Mix A contains primers to amplify the six variant alleles detected by the kit. This mix also contains wild type primers for the detection of one of the normal alleles, which is used as a control for the A mix. Both the A and B mixes contain primers for the identification of two short tandem repeat markers. These markers should match between the A and B mixes to show that there has not been a sample mix up. CPYZ primer mix B contains wild type primers to amplify the normal alleles with the exception of the normal primers included in the A primer mix. This sample met the quality acceptance criteria as all the peaks are above 500 relative fluorescent units, all wild type peaks are present, and the short tandem repeat markers match. As no variant peaks were detected, this is an example of a patient with normal DPD function who would not require a fluoropyrimidine dose reduction. The next case is an example of a heterozygous variant detected. This example is the most common variant detected. The patient has three variants, which are all parts of the HAT B3 that Holly has previously mentioned. This patient is heterozygous as the respective normal green peaks are still present, although at reduced peak height. Even though there are three variant peaks, this result should be reported as the variant highlighted at the top of the slide, as this is the functional variant. The functional variant creates a splice site leading to misplicing of an intronic sequence into the DPYD messenger RNA. The other variants are tagging SNPs. The functional variant has been found in multiple studies to be in perfect linkage with the variant at the 1236 locus. However, the variant at the 483 locus is not in complete linkage. We have seen several patients who do not have the 483 variant. These patients would have the same phenotype as the HAC B3. We've also seen uh, several patients with the 483 variant alone, which current research suggests would not have a functional effect, so a normal dose of fluoropyrimidine could be given. 
As Holly previously discussed, we use the CPIT guidelines and use activity scores to decide if patients need fluoropyrimidine dose adjustment. This patient is heterozygous for HAT B3, and the normal allele has an activity value of 1, and the variant allele has an activity value of 4.5. Therefore, the total activity score is 1.5, and the patient is a DPYD intermediate metabolizer with increased risk of fluoropyrimidine toxicity that requires a 50% dose reduction. Even if this patient had one non-functional variant and a total score of 1, the treatment strategy would be the same. All heterozygous variants require a 50% dose reduction, whether they score 1 or 1.5. Next is an example of a homozygous variant. We've only had one homozygous patient since testing has begun, so these are very rare. The patient has a single blue peak and no green peak at the 1905 locus. Therefore, they are homozygous for this variant. Both markers for this variant are included in the amix. Therefore, there are still five normal allele peaks present in the bmix. This variant is predicted to result in a non-functional DPD protein, and as the patient has two copies, the patient's activity score is zero. So the patient has no functional alleles of the DPYD gene. As a result of this, this patient would be unable to metabolize pyrimidines and would have a very high risk of severe or fatal toxicity when treated with fluoropyrimidines. This patient is a DPYD poor metabolizer with complete DPD deficiency. Fluoropyrimidine use should be avoided in this patient. Complete DPD deficiency is very rare and is usually associated with symptoms such as intellectual disability, motor retardation and convulsions. But as was the case with this patient, it can also be asymptomatic. So the next example is a case where compound heterozygous variants were detected. Detection of two DPYD variants is rare and occurs in only about 0.2% of patients. This patient has the HAP B3 and a variant as the 1679 locus and is compound heterozygous. From this assay, we cannot be sure if the variant is in trans with one variant on each allele or in cis with one allele with two variants and one functional allele. We assume it's in trans in the worst case scenario for the dosage recommendations. This patient has two variants that are assumed to be in trans with no fully functional allele. The activity score is 0.5. The patient is a DPYD poor metabolizer with increased risk of severe fluoropyrimidine toxicity. In this patient, use of fluoropyrimidine should have been avoided, but the CPIT guidelines state that if there is no alternative, a much lower dose of fluoropyrimidine could be used, but requires very careful titration and monitoring. The next case is also a patient with compound heterozygous, but they have different variants. This patient has a HAT B3, but this time with a different variant at the 2846 locus. This results in a decreased function DPYD rather than a non functional DPYD allele. In this case, the total activity score is 1, as both alleles are partially functional. Therefore, this patient is a DPYD intermediate metabolizer rather than a poor metabolizer. This patient can be treated with fluoropyrimidines, but at a 50% reduced dose. This is the same recommendation as patients who are heterozygous for one variant. This highlights the importance to check the CPIT guideline for compound heterozygotes, as different combinations of variants require different treatment strategies. Next, I will discuss how we investigate incidental findings. Although we test for the common variants included in the NHS England recommendations, other variants can affect DPD function. This can result in the detection of incidental findings, which require further investigation. Since we started testing, we have observed the double peak for one of the wild-type markers for three patients. 
This suggests a small deletion or insertion for one of the alleles. These findings require investigation using Sanger sequencing to fully elucidate the variant, as it could suggest the presence of a pathogenic variant. Deletions or insertions result in Sanger sequencing with a mixed trace. However, a mixed trace doesn't always mean that the variant would have functional significance, especially when a variant occurs in an intronic region. Classification of the three variants identified as incidental findings was undertaken following the criteria set out by the Personalised Medicine Commission expert panel. The top two variants were within intronic regions and were not reported in databases or the literature. In silico studies did not suggest that these variants would disrupt spike sites, therefore variant analysis classified these two variants to be of uncertain significance. However, this variant resulted in a frame shift in exon 11 and the addition of a stop codon that would terminate amino acid translation. Therefore, a novel actionable variant that was likely pathogenic was identified through investigating an incidental finding. This shows the importance of following up all incidental findings which require further investigation. Figures generated on the 19th of March 2021 show that we have now tested over 2,500 patients. Just over 8% of these were found to have at least one of the four variants in DPYD that are known to cause toxicity to fluoropyrimidine. That equates to a total of 214 patients for whom we have identified a variant prior to treatment. Without this test, these patients would have been given the standard dose of chemotherapy, which would have likely caused toxicity. The implementation of this test has therefore already been successful in preventing serious harm or even death in 214 individuals. We are now receiving around 100 samples a week of 20 samples a day from patients across, across the northwest of England. If you would like any further information on the DPYD service, then please check out Holly's YouTube channel, The Scout Scientist. She uses this platform to encourage more young people to follow in her footsteps and pursue a career in science. She has recently produced an episode on DPYD testing where she filmed the entire laboratory process from a blood sample arriving in the lab to the report going out. So if you're interested in finding out more, then please watch the video and subscribe to her channel. In summary, we hope we have fulfilled our learning objectives and highlighted the importance of DPYD testing prior to treatment with fluoropyrimidine chemotherapies. We hope you now understand how the service has been implemented for use in routine clinical practice. We would like to acknowledge the work of all the staff at the Northwest Genomic Laboratory Hub who were involved in the DPYD service, as well as the team at Georgine Health for providing the DPYD testing kit that we're currently using for service delivery. We would finally like to say thank you for listening and we're happy to answer any questions.